Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and this is the Glock 45. That's right, we now have a Glock 45, which means if you want to, you can carry a 9mm and use that same tire joke of I carry a 45 because they do not make a 46. The Glock 45 is not in 45 caliber, which is confusing to some people until they remember the Glock 22 is not in 22 caliber. Uh, the numbers have absolutely nothing to do with caliber. I think most people figured that out by now, hopefully. What we have in the Glock 45 is a perfect amalgamation between Gen 5 features and the grip and slide profile that we found with the 19X. It's no secret that I was a fan of the 19X. I like the profile. I like the full-size frame with the compact-ish length slide, which some people feel still today, even with the Glock 45, virtually the same measurements, uh, they feel like, well, that's, that's the wrong way. I don't want it that way. I want a full-size slide with a compact length grip, uh, mainly for concealment issues. I carry appendix unless I'm in a duty rig. Uh, so for me, concealment is more of an issue of comfort at length versus grip length because it, with carrying an appendix, the grip length, unless I'm carrying an extended magazine, has never really been an issue. I like full-size guns as far as grips go. Uh, as far as slide length goes, I don't really care, I guess I should say, I don't really need that additional quarter to half an inch of sight radius, especially since I primarily carry red dot guns. Uh, so the Glock 45 fits that niche. Uh, it's not the first gun to do it. In fact, <laughs> uh, I recently had a conversation with someone who carried an M&P standard full-size. Uh, and they were bemoaning the size profile, relationship slide length to grip length of the, the uh, Glock 45. And uh, I had to kind of scratch my head and say, but your gun has the exact same profile. Uh, granted, some small changes because they're two totally different brands, but ultimately the standard size, full size M&P shares the same grip to slide ratio that the Glock 19X and the Glock 45 do. Uh, you'll also find it with, from Ruger. You'll find it, of course, the Colt Commander being the most venerable uh, gun to share that grip to slide profile. Uh, and you can also find it from in the VP9 and many other brands uh, that are out there. So I had to kind of scratch my head as to why someone didn't realize that they were carrying the same gun. But that's kind of beside the point. That's going to continue to be a controversial issue, even though is if the 19X's sales are any evidence... Uh, a lot of people don't care and, in fact, actually prefer that size profile. Of course, some people may be collectors or something like that, but I know quite a few people who were very, very excited with the size profile that you're getting from the Glock 45. But if you already bought a 19X or you haven't bought a 19X and you're considering either the 19X or the Glock 45, your question might be, well, why one versus the other? Now, this isn't a comparison video uh, between the 19X and the Glock 45, but I feel like I have to bring the 19X up because the common question I hear is, why would I get a Glock 45 when the 19X exists? Or why does the 45 exist when the 19X exists? Why did they do it? Well, what they've done is, hopefully, and it, it certainly seems to, they've listened to some of the issues with the 19X. Not performance issues, but uh, features. Uh, and they looked at their Gen 5 offerings uh, and included them into the, uh, the Glock 45. I've got ambidextrous slide releases. Uh, I've got a reversible magazine release, which is features of the Gen 5 that you're, you've come to expect. Uh, new feature is I've got forward cocking serrations, which is something a lot of people have been asking for for a long time. Now, there's some uh, people out there that think, oh, cocking serrations are, you know, the newest fad or whatever. You don't need to manipulate the gun from the front, or why do you really need them? You don't really need You can still manipulate the gun without them, which is true depending on the environment, what's on your hands and temperature and things like that. Uh, but again, forward cocking serrations are not 
new uh, at all. In fact, they go back a long, long way. Uh, some of uh, some early semi-automatic handguns had them, so it's not a new concept. Um, but where the 45 departs from the 19X significantly is the uh, the magazine well uh, has a different profile. They've removed the lip, and it does not have the cutout that you find on the traditional Gen 5s. So I've got an uninterrupted, uh, slightly flared magwell, which people who like magwells, flared magwells. Um, can get into. I like it for one specific reason as far as a magwell is concerned, the fact that I don't have to add on a magwell. And because I don't have to add on a magwell, I'm not changing the overall length profile or width profile of the magwell when it comes to stripping OEM floor plate magazines. Now the 19X's magwell uh, had that little lip on it and it did not like Gen 5 magazines. You can't get them in there, it won't accept them. Uh, whereas the Glock 45 uh, was used every magazine I have, Gen 5 all the way back to Gen 3. I think I might have a Gen 2 magazine in there. As long as I'm using the uh, magazine release on the traditional left side of the gun, uh, it uses every magazine I have. My review process is 2,000 rounds. Now, primarily, ammunition that's going to be fired is going to be 124 grain FMJ. Uh, but I also included uh, 300 rounds of 124 plus P throughout the review process, including during the burndown. Uh, because that's a duty grade ammunition, that's something that people would expect they're going to be able to run reliably, feed reliably, not create any problems. Uh, first thing I did when I got the Glock 45, because uh, I didn't have to zero it, um, although I did have to make a small adjustment to the rear sights, which I'll get into, um, uh, took it and did the burn down. If you're not familiar, the burn down is 500 rounds as fast as possible to accelerate that fire life cycle. Get the gun hot, get the gun running, and see if any problems are created when the gun is at a higher than casual temperature. So, here's the And this is how I will earn my arthritis. Five hundred rounds, no issues, which I didn't really expect any issues. Glock is a little bit boring sometimes in its reliability, and the fact that uh, across all the Glocks that I have, I've never had significant problems that weren't related to part wear from round count. Uh, I've got a couple Glocks that are that are very, very, very high round counts, and I've had to replace strikers, I've had to replace extractors. Those parts that are perishable because they're the parts that are punished every time the gun is loaded, every time the gun is fired. Uh, they're involved in a lot of uh, friction uh, during the cycle of fire, so you expect those parts to be somewhat perishable, and they, they wear out over time. Uh, if you're not able to shoot thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds a month or thousands of rounds a year, uh, those parts may last you for the lifetime of the gun as long as you own it because you're just not going to see that high of a round count. But because I shoot for a living, uh, it, it's it's not common for me to experience those issues. But within the 2,000 rounds uh, with the Glock 45, I didn't experience a single issue uh, mechanically or ammunition related, which is always nice as well. Unfortunately, Glock still is not making metal sights, uh, quote-unquote, standard uh, on their offerings. It, it's an option. This comes with a set of Ameriglows. Those are an option on the Glock 45, and they're actually really good sights. They're night sights, which I prefer fiber optics if I'm going to go irons only. Covered that in another video. Uh, but I do like the sights. One thing I didn't, one thing I noticed when I immediately got the gun, uh, literally from uh, the, uh, the manufacturer, is my rear sight was considerably off. I had to take the slide off, throw it in my, uh, my slide mover, and make corrections in the rear sight, come out the range, make sure everything was good when I, when I finally brought the gun out to fire it. Uh, I don't know exactly why that issue was, and hopefully it was just a one-off kind of situation, but definitely when you pick up the Glock 45, as you should anyway, check your sights, uh, especially if you don't have a sight pusher, um, and then you can do it hopefully right there in the gun store where you pick your guns up and they can make that correction for you, or if you have to, send it in a Glock and they'll do it for free. just sucks because you know, you'll have to lose your gun for a little while when you just got it. But it's definitely something because we need to be accurate. We make sure we check on our sights. Uh, I'm kind of... Uh, specific about mine, I usually use a micrometer to make sure everything's exactly how it's supposed to be, uh, but that's just me over time uh, through the experience of my career. Um, sometimes the sights look like they're good and they're not, and 
despite popular belief, sometimes when you're shooting to the right or shooting to the left, it actually can be the sights. So it's a good thing to check once you've checked yourself. Accuracy is always uh, a topic of conversation with any firearm. How accurate is it? When it comes to handguns, they're inherently harder to control uh, than rifles because we only have those two points of contact if we have both hands available. Uh, and it's very hard to find a comfortable and uh, repeatable position uh, for bracing off of objects. So accuracy is somewhat subjective to the shooter, but also there's a large part to play in the gun. Now, the Glock 45 comes with the Glock Marksman barrel, just like you saw with the Glock 19X. Uh, so I expected very similar accuracy. I shot two five-round groups at 25 yards using two different types of ammunition. I used 124 grain plus P gold dot, and I used 124 grain prime. Uh, a range ammo. A little bit higher priced range ammo, but definitely worth the quality of accuracy is a huge concern of yours even in your practice ammunition. So here's those two five round groups. I'm impressed with the performance. Again, that was bench rest, so I wasn't freestanding firing that, and I honestly believe if I'd had a red dot and RMR on this gun, the groups would have been a little bit tighter. That's really good performance of an out-of-the-box gun. You don't have to worry about whose aftermarket barrel should I get. Should I get it in TIN or Cerakote or whatever? Just the barrel that's in the gun is going to work. Uh, aftermarket barrels are great for certain purposes. I use them for threaded purposes only, generally. Um, but it's nice to see that I don't need to seek out another barrel that's match or ultra match or, or whatever the, the, the buzzword is uh, because the barrel that comes in the gun is going to give me the accuracy that I want. Uh, and that's really good accuracy out of a handgun at 25 yards. And again, it is a handgun. Now, some people say, you know, I want that longer sight radius and that's the reason I don't like the Glock 45 because I can shoot more accurately with that longer sight radius. Eh, probably not. Uh, just being honest, um, the longer sight radius gives you a better ability to fine-tune a sight picture, but let's be honest, that additional quarter to half an inch of barrel, depending on what profile we're talking about, is not going to give you a measurable greater accuracy at the shooter. Uh, if you put this gun in a ransom rest against a Gen 5 Glock 17, I don't think you'd see a difference at all in the available accuracy between the two guns at the mechanical level. So it ultimately comes down to the shooter. Um, granted, the less sight radius you have, the, the less fine-tuning you can do, but we're not losing a whole lot of sight radius when it comes to Glock 45 over a full-size slide, which is the complaint that, that most people bring up. Um, to me, it, it all comes into what, what critical thinking have we applied to the gun and what is our actual complaint? Is it grip size that's really our concealment issue or is it slide length? Of course, this isn't a video about concealment techniques and, and gun sizes and things like that, but I, I feel like I should bring it up and, and touch on it again uh, because it's one of those things. Uh, it's something that's going to continue to come up. People want that longer sight radius or that longer barrel, uh, but they want the shorter frame, uh, the shorter grip, I should say, for concealment. If you carry appendix, uh, your, your biggest concern is probably going to be slide length for seating, for moving around, because uh, you spend probably as much time sitting down as you do standing up, depending on you know what you do. And of course, when you drive, you do that seated, and there's comfort issues involved in that. If you carry at the hip inside the waistband, I can see obviously grip is going to be a concern. I like the larger grip for, for really one main reason besides magazine capacity, and that's going to be runway on my draw stroke. Uh, I notice when I carry my 26, which is rare, but I do carry it sometimes, the, the draw stroke has to be 100% perfect, and we should always uh, strive for that perfection in draw stroke. But let's be honest, we don't practice our draw stroke from every single physical position we can find ourselves in to build the proficiency in the moment. That's why our technique needs to be modular, which is why I like the larger grip. It gives me more room for slight errors in my draw stroke, regardless of physical position, that I'm going to get from a 19 or a 26th length gun. That's why I like the larger grip. It doesn't conceal any worse uh, to me, uh, based on how I dress, than a 19 would. Uh, if you carry a 19, I'm willing to bet that you can probably comfortably conceal a full-size 17, and, but you, if you carry appendix, you'd probably opt for the Glock 45 or the Glock 19X, uh, or a gun of a similar profile, because it gives you more comfort and more concealability, and it, it, it causes the gun to press less. Uh, when you're seated or when you're in other positions other than just standing. Another feature that I definitely want to touch on, and this carries over from the 19X, is the trigger. 
uh, the Gen 5 trigger overall is improved, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, the new safety plunger design and the, the, newly, the new striker system, or the slightly changed design to the striker. I think that definitely took a lot of the grit out of the trigger. Uh, now, I'm not a trigger reset guy. I'm not going to sit here and show you a cool video of me riding the trigger reset or anything like that. Uh, ultimately, it's the, the maximum weight where the gun breaks and how fast it returns to a reset for us to be able to shoot again. That's what we're looking for uh, in trigger. Um, the, the Glock breaks at just over 5.5, five, at least the, the one I have do and you have does. Um, and if you look on the website at their specifications, they quoted at 26 newtons, which comes out to be like, it's weird that they did it in newtons, but uh, comes out to be uh, right there at uh, 5.8 point, bunch of other numbers. Uh, so you're looking at 5.5 five, uh, after some rounds. Hopefully it'll break in for you. But anywhere between 5 and 6, uh, my personal opinion has always been, you know, 4 pounds to 6 pounds is a reasonable trigger. Anything below that, uh, you run you run the chance of short stroke in the gun. Anything over that, uh, it can create some significant convulsion issues in your grip because you're pulling a lot of weight. If you haven't shot a 12-pound New York-style trigger out of a Glock, uh, just go ahead and pass that opportunity on up because it's a horrible experience and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Uh, so being right there in that sweet spot of right around between five and six pounds is a great trigger weight for just every day. Uh, I'm not one of those guys that says you have to have an aftermarket 3.5 pound trigger in your gun. I still don't really care for the Glock profile of trigger. I don't like the curve. It does trap the finger a little bit. Not as much as some other guns that are out there. I do prefer a flat face trigger. So just being honest, going down the road, I'm probably going to put a flat face trigger in this gun because that's the trigger profile I prefer. However, if we use that old hypothetical, uh, if you had to carry any gun out of the box, what would it be? I would lean heavily towards the Glock 45 over some guns I've said in the past, because that was the past, this is now, I'm allowed to change my mind based on new technology, new features, new guns. Glock 45, especially with those sights, I've got metal sights, uh, I've got ambidextrous uh, magazine releases, I've got a reversible, uh, or I should say, I've got ambidextrous slide stop, I've got a reversible magazine release, I've got forward cocking serrations, which as primarily a left-handed shooter, I don't really use. Uh, but when I do shoot right-handed, I do tend to manipulate the gun from the front, so it's nice that those are there, and I like them they're there, because why shouldn't they be if there's room for them? Uh, and I've got a full-size capacity with a compact-ish length slide. So the Glock 45 out of the box is a great carry gun. Can it be improved? Absolutely. If there's certain features that you need for your personal self-defense or for competition or for duty carry, there's definitely things you can do. Obviously, I wish the texture on the frame was more aggressive. I like the most aggressive frame possible, close to sandpaper, because you only get, you only get one chance to get that grip perfectly right when you stipple it or something like that. So seeing something a little bit more aggressive from the manufacturer would be nice. Now, that being said, it is more aggressive than it used to be with your Gen 4s, your Gen 3s, so on and so forth. So they are getting there. Uh, but I think just from the general populace, they're probably not going to get too much more aggressive than this uh, because it's kind of like Mexican food or Thai food. Thai hot is not always Thai hot because the person ordering it may not know what they're getting into. So if the frame was super, super aggressive, it would turn more people off. That's a niche market for that really aggressive framework. So is the Glock 45 for you? Well, if you like the size profile, if you already have a VP9 or an M&P or an FNS or an FN509 or I know there's a Ruger that has the same profile, of course, the Colt Commander, which I already mentioned, um, that, so that size profile only exists with one our Glock, and that's the 19X. And my biggest issue with the 19X, and it's not even really an issue at all, it's not a big deal, but it's something I would have rather seen them not do, uh, is the fact that it's very magazine specific. It likes Gen 4 and, and previous mags. Uh, with the Gen 5 guns, they've got that front cutout, that interruption in the magwell, which I don't care for. Uh, so the Glock 45 definitely fixed those issues. I love the trigger. I love the sights that are optional on it. You can get uh, magazine capacity, overall profile, um, accuracy is great. Trigger is great. It's a great gun. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely recommend the Glock 45 uh, over the 19X if you're magazine specific. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Of course, the 19X is only available in Desert Tan, which is very 2005. Uh, but it's a color that a lot of people like. Now, myself and me, I'd rather have OD green, but that's personal preference when we get into the aesthetics of color. Uh, but the uh, DLC finish on it is, is good. It's a, it's a black gun. Uh, black guns are you know, very, very prevalent. No big issues. I think everybody's okay with owning a black gun. Um, long term, how's the gun going to perform? I only put 2,000 rounds through it, but if it's like any other Glock I've ever owned, I expect boring, 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 boring reliability occasionally a part will wear out just like it would with any gun. Uh, I don't consider, I don't see any significant issues to, to arise with the Glock 45. So I would definitely recommend it to anybody who likes that size profile. And if 
you're apprehensive or you're suspicious of the size profile and you think to yourself, oh, I couldn't conceal that, I challenge you to check it out. Uh, you don't have to run out and buy one just to check it out because, you know, that's a little bit more expensive to do an experiment. But if you have someone, know someone who has one or has a gun in the same size profile, check it out, borrow it, feel it, wear it, and see if it's going to work for you because you're going to get better concealability and better comfort when it comes to various physical positions, especially if you carry inside the waistband appendix uh, versus some of the other full-size guns that are out there. Uh, even if you run a weapon light, it's still a different footprint. It's still a different size L, uppercase versus lowercase, if you will, or small versus larger L. That 90-degree angle does create a different profile against the human anatomy because that's something people brought up. Well, if you run a weapon light on it, why don't you just carry a Glock 34? I'm still getting that notch, uh, and that notch is helpful uh, right there over the appendix when it comes to seated positions because the light's going to be on the outside of the body. The gun's going to be on the inside of the body, whether you're left or right-handed. So it still makes a difference even though the light extends past the gun regardless of gun length. Uh, and that's just getting into the very, very fine minutia of concealment from appendix or other body positions. Carrying the hip doesn't really matter. Uh, at least in my experience, it hasn't considered created a significant issue, weapon light versus no weapon light. Obviously, on the hip, no weapon light is going to print a little bit less inside the waistband. Uh, but the grip profile is roughly going to remain the same. Uh, but yeah, definitely check it out and see if it's something for you because it gives you a little bit more comfort, a little bit more modularity uh, in your concealment options inside the waistband that you're going to get from a full-size gun. Another huge feature, um, well, not really a feature, but another huge possible bonus if you're into it is now you can, because there's so many different ones out there, now you can compensate uh, the gun. Uh, and depending on which comp you choose, you're going to get a 17 length, maybe slightly longer, not quite 34 length gun um, without having to go 17 plus or 34 plus with a comp. So you get to save a little bit of uh, overall slide length, even if you're going to comp the gun, which I'm pretty into, to be honest with you. I like compensators. Um, I'm not going to get into, you know, should you compensate a 9mm? I, I feel like, you know, why not? Um, but separate video, separate conversation. I've already covered that topic. So long story short, Glock 45 is an awesome gun. Highly recommend. Over 2,000 rounds. Very, very happy with it. And I plan on uh, putting a dot on it soon and uh, might end up carrying it. I'm Eric Cow with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.